Last week, we finally got our hands on an RTX 3060. And this week, we're going to see if we can make it better. For free. Stay tuned. Do you like saving money? Of course you do. You need to check out today's sponsor, Slick Deals. Slick Deals has a free browser extension available to make saving money online even easier. When you're on a website, just click on the browser extension and it shows you all the deals available for that website. This browser extension will automatically search through all of the most up-to-date coupon codes to find you the best savings based on what you currently have in your cart. Check out this deal I found on Foster & Grant glasses. I love these glasses, but end up breaking a pair at least once a year. Maybe I should buy two. So, follow the link in the description below and get the free Slick Deals browser extension and start saving money today. Unless you don't like saving money. Who doesn't like a free upgrade? In our last video, I mentioned that we're going to try to make this 3060 as fast as a 3060 Ti, and that starts today. But that may be a hard feat, because according to userbenchmarks.com, the 3060 Ti is 34% faster than a 3060. We definitely have some catching up to do if we're going to match the 3060 Ti. We're going to start by simply overclocking it and seeing how close we can get to that for free. So. Let's turn some dials and see what we can get this card to do. Okay, so there's gonna be a few programs you're gonna to need to do this. And the first one is gonna be MSI Afterburner. Now I've gone over this program before, but I'll show you how to use it again real quick here. But this is a really powerful program for overclocking GPUs. Now the next program that we're gonna need is something that can put a load on the GPU while we're overclocking it. And for that, I use the Heaven benchmark. It works really good for this. Now the reason why I use Heaven in the background is for a couple different reasons. The first one is, is that it will bring the GPU up to 100% and it'll allow you to see boost clocks in real time as you're overclocking the GPU. But the second reason, and even more importantly, is that once you hit a boost clock that your GPU can't handle, it will crash the program. So it makes it a lot quicker to be able to find a stable core clock by using Heaven in the background while you're overclocking. So let's get to it. Okay, so the first thing that we wanna do before we start overclocking is go ahead and increase the power and temperature limit. Now the reason why we need to increase the power and temperature limit is because we need to have more overhead to be able to overclock into. Keep in mind, we're gonna be pushing the GPU beyond its original specs. So obviously it's gonna take more power and it's probably gonna get hotter. So we increase the power and temp limits all the way so we can overclock into that. And then once you increase the power and temp limits, it's also a good idea to increase the fan speed as well because if it's gonna be running hotter, then we're gonna need more cooling as well. So once we do that, as soon as we hit apply, you'll be able to hear the fans in the background start to ramp up. I don't know how well my mic picked them up, but they're loud, trust me. Now that we have everything set up and we're ready to overclock, we're gonna go ahead and fire up the Heaven benchmark by hitting the run button. It's gonna take a minute for this benchmark to fire up, but once it does, we'll be able to start messing around with the core and memory. And to do that, we go ahead and click on here and just go ahead and start increasing these in small increments. Now this isn't really a rule, this is just the way I do it right here, but normally a GPU can handle 100 megahertz on the core. So if you start out at 100, you can go ahead and hit apply and you'll see right here, I jumped up to 2025. And typically any GPU will do 100 megahertz, but like I said, this isn't a rule, this is just what I've found to be the average. At this point, what you're gonna to wanna to do is increase this by small increments. So go from 100 to 120, hit apply. And as you can see, this will jump up a little bit more and continue to increase it by 20 megahertz each time until you reach a point to where the GPU is no longer stable. Now I know that point for the Heaven benchmark on this GPU is 200 megahertz and it will run that pretty solid for essentially ever from when I tested it. However, you don't wanna stop there. At this point, it's a really good idea to fire up some of your favorite games and start playing them for a little bit and see how stable that overclock is in game. Because 
typically in a benchmark, it's not necessarily stressing your computer in the same ways that a game would. Now, what I found is when I was running at 200 megahertz over stock, it would crash pretty often. So I ended up having to lower it down to 180 and the cork became pretty stable. So once you find a stable core clock, now it's time to move on to the memory. Let me show you how to do that. Okay, so this, my stable overclock for the core is 180, so we're gonna set that, hit apply, and now it's time to start playing around with the memory overclock. And for that, I find the memory overclock to be a little bit easier to do than the core because of what you'll see in the screen here. And let me show you how to do it. So I know for a fact that this GDDR6 will do at least a thousand megahertz over stock. So we're gonna go ahead and do that and hit apply. And that should be pretty stable. Now that's not gonna be the same for every card, but for this card right here, I know it can do it. And I've played around with this thing for quite a bit. And I have found the most stable overclock that I can get is at about 1300 but just like with the core you want to do this in small increments so for instance if we were at a thousand you would want to go to say 1100 then if it's stable at 1100 go ahead and go to 1200 and then from that point continue to increase your memory clock until you find that you'll start to see different visual aberrations or different artifacts within the screen. Let me show you how it does that. So like I said, I can get up to 1300 just fine without artifacting. But if I go over that, I start to see a lot of artifacts. So we're just gonna jump it up to, let's say 1400. Go ahead and hit apply. Now keep an eye on the screen here and wait and see if you see any artifacts or anything. And what they'll look like is on mine, they'll look like these little starbursts that'll just appear out of nowhere. And typically they appear over 1300 megahertz. It looks as if maybe it's making a liar out of me now. So let's go ahead and jump this thing up to, let's say 1450. That should hopefully start to show us some artifacting. All right, let's try 1500. Hit apply. And there we go. Now we're starting to see some artifacting. So go ahead and look at the screen really close and you'll notice these little kind of like starbursts that'll start showing up out of nowhere. And they'll start showing up pretty often in most cases. Now obviously this one, they had little lights, but you can still see those starbursts kind of just appearing at different random intervals within the screen. And they tend to get Oh, there's one right there. Okay, so you can see what I'm talking about. So I'm gonna go ahead and lower this thing back down to 1300 where those artifacts disappear. So the artifact test isn't perfect. I've had circumstances in the past where it hasn't worked, but for the most part, most of the time it works pretty good. But in order to find out if you have a stable overclock, you gotta get the thing into games and just start playing. And if you start crashing, then what you can do is one tip that I can give you to help you in a situation like that is go ahead and decide to just eliminate one, either the core or the memory. Typically, I start with the memory. Drop the memory down to stock, then play your game and see if it continues to crash like it did before. If it does, then drop down your core overclock a little bit, and as long as it gets stable, then you should be good. However, if eliminating the memory overclock stops the crashing, then you know it was the memory overclock that was causing it in the first place. And in that case, just bring the memory down a little bit more and see if the crashing continues. But now, we need to find out if this overclock actually helped us any. So for that, we're gonna have to take a look at the benchmarks. So let's do it now. The first benchmark we're looking at today is Heaven. Since we got it open, we might as well take a look. This is gonna be the only synthetic benchmark that we're using today. In Heaven, without an overclock, we averaged 131.9 FPS. This gave us a score of 3324. Now, I remember a time when this system couldn't even average 60 FPS in this benchmark. It's definitely come a long way, hasn't it? Once overclocked, we were able to reach an average of 143.7 FPS. That's an 8.6% improvement over stock, and so far, a pretty good start. If the other benchmarks see improvements like this, then we should be doing pretty good. The next game we're looking at today is Dirt Rally 2. This is a fairly demanding game and tends to depend a lot on the GPU, so we should see a pretty good improvement. 
With that said, before the overclock, we got an average of 135 FPS. The game ran pretty consistent with a 1% low of 111.6 and a 0.1% low of 109. This was on ultra settings also. Once overclocked, we were able to score an average of 146.2 FPS. That's an 8% improvement over stock. The game, just like before, held a very consistent frame rate with a 1% low of 120.6 and a 0.1% low of 114.8. I was happy to see a consistent improvement in game as we did in the Heaven Synthetic Benchmark because typically synthetic benchmarks tend to show exaggerated improvements that you don't necessarily see in games, but this overclock seems to be pretty consistent so far. The next game we're looking at is Red Dead Redemption 2. This game is extremely hard on hardware, and it's the only game that we're testing on medium settings. Without the overclock, we were able to average 65 FPS. It's not uncommon to get lower frame rates in this game because of how demanding it is. But with that said, the frame rate was pretty consistent with a 1% low of 48.1 and a 0.1% low of 40.4. Once overclocked, we were able to average 69.2 FPS. That doesn't seem like a huge improvement, but considering where we started at the lower frame rate, it accounts for a 7.8% improvement over stock. The overclock also gave us an equally stable frame rate with a 1% low of 51.1 and a 0.1% low of 44.7. Seems like we're starting to see a pattern, but we're going to have to look at the rest of the benchmarks to see if we continue to see such a consistent improvement across the board. The next game we're looking at is Cyberpunk 2077. This is the first game we're testing that supports ray tracing, so I tested it with and without RT. However, for these tests, we left DLSS off because DLSS doesn't put the GPU under as much strain, so it's not gonna show us what we're gaining from our overclock. Without the overclock and with ray tracing off, we were able to average 89.6 FPS. The game struggled in a few parts, but we still maintained a 1% low of 50.8 and a 0.1% low of 32.1. Once overclocked and without ray tracing, we were able to get an average of 92.4 FPS. This is the lowest improvement yet with only a 3% improvement over stock. Our frame rate still struggled too with a 1% low of 58.4 and a 0.1% low of 49.3. Now, with ray tracing enabled and the overclock turned off, we were able to get an average of 35.6 FPS. Also, in this case, our frame rate was much more consistent with a 1% low of 29.2 and a 1% low of 25.5. Once overclocked and with ray tracing on, we were able to get an average of 37.8 FPS. This is a much better improvement without ray tracing, giving us an improvement of 6% over stock. The frame rate also remained more consistent with a 1% low of 30.1 and a 0.1% low of 26.6. The Cyberpunk benchmarks didn't show us the improvement that we saw from the other games so far, and I believe I know why. I believe we're coming really close to being CPU limited. In fact, in this game, we're absolutely CPU limited. The reason why we saw such a better improvement with ray tracing enabled was because ray tracing requires more from the GPU, so the overclock was much more productive. As you can see from this graph from MSI Afterburner, the CPU usage was just about maxed out with ray tracing disabled. And because of that, the GPU didn't have to work as hard. It was waiting for the CPU to catch up. However, when we look at the CPU usage with ray tracing enabled, it fluctuated much lower and showed the GPU to essentially stay maxed out the entire time. So we definitely don't see as big of an improvement in this game, and I really believe that's the fault of the CPU more than the GPU, especially when we saw a much better improvement once the GPU was able to max itself out. 
The next game we're looking at today is Shadow of the Tomb Raider. This game is set to high and it's also another game that supports ray tracing. So, like before, I tested it with ray tracing on and off. With ray tracing off and no overclock, we were able to average 125.2 FPS. The frame rate wasn't as consistent as it's been with other games, but it wasn't bad with a 1% low of 98.6 and a 0.1% low of 66.2. Once overclocked, we were able to average 137.3 FPS. This gave us a huge 9.2% improvement over stock. And oddly enough, it seems with the overclock, the frame rate became a little more consistent. With a 1% low in range at 107.4 FPS, but a 0.1% low that was much improved at 83.3. Once ray tracing was enabled, I turned the overclock off and was able to get an average of 123.8 FPS. The frame rates, like before, wasn't as consistent with a 1% low of 94.3 and a 0.1% low of 54.5. However, once I turned the overclock back on, I got an average of 135.6 FPS. That's a 9.1% improvement over stock. Also, just like before, the frame rates became much more consistent with a 1% low that was in range at 103.5, but a much better 0.1% low of 76.5. The part that surprised me with this test is not just the overall improvement we got in this game with the overclock, even though it was the best yet, but how much more consistent the frame rate was after overclocking. The overclock didn't affect the 1% lows that much more than the average, but it did improve the 0.1% lows a lot. Without ray tracing, it was over 20% improvement, but with ray tracing, it was a huge 36% improvement. At least we know that we have a very stable overclock. As you can see from the benchmarks, we got an average performance increase of 8%. That means we only have 26% more to go to match the TI. Unfortunately, our CPU may become a problem. If we're already having issues with being CPU limited, then that's definitely going to get worse as we get faster. So we may have to do something about that as well. Either way, this did give us a free 8% performance boost. So we really can't be upset with that. However, I think we can get more. I noticed while overclocking that the system would run fine at a 200 megahertz overclock on the core. However, it was unstable in games as soon as the GPU hit the low 60s. So we could bring the temperature down, we might be able to get some more out of our core clock. Also, if you look at this graph here from MSI Afterburner, you can see that in Cyberpunk, when the CPU was limited, the GPU stayed around 2.1 gigahertz. However, when the GPU wasn't being held back by the CPU, the core clock fluctuated quite a bit. This is clearly due to the CPU dropping boost bins due to temperature when it's under load. Now, what's the best way to bring down temperature? Is it not water? But wait, who's crazy enough to water cool a 3060? Well, maybe me. You're going to have to wait and see how it goes. In the meantime, check out this video where I water cooled this system with a complete water cooling kit from Corsair. It's actually a pretty decent kit. Have a great day.